My name's Kent, and today we're going to go over how to unlearn irritable bowel syndrome using pain reprocessing therapy. I'm going to introduce Michelle, and then I'm going to turn over the conversation. And um, okay, so Michelle Wiegers is a certified professional life and mind body coach. Um, she's writer and poet who discovered her creative voice and mind body coaching work after recovering from over 25 years of chronic pain, fibromyalgia, sciatica, ME-CFS, POTS, IBS, and symptoms associated with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. She creates restorative healing experiences with individual clients and through her online course, How We Heal Chronic Pain and Fatigue. Um, and now um, I'm gonna turn it over to the host of the podcast, Our Power Is Within, Chasmith. Thank you, Chasmith. Yay, thanks, Kent. We'll start out with uh, Michelle. Can you talk to us about your experience dealing with abdominal symptoms such as irritable, irritable bowel? Sure, yeah. So for me, my um, actually my earliest TMS symptoms, my body symptoms were IBS. So um, I didn't have the diagnosis that young, but as a child, I had, um, you know, some of the gross symptoms like constipation, diarrhea, nausea, bloating, um, hiccups and burps, um, just overall gut distress. And um, so those were experiences that um, I really, I've really dealt with my entire life. It didn't really come to the forefront um, as far as a major life issue until I was in college. And so I went into like a lot of testing with a gastroenterologist. Um, I was diagnosed with IBS in college, told at that point, uh, uh, GIs were saying, don't eat tomatoes, onions, oranges, like all the acidic things. I think now it's like different. Don't eat dairy, don't eat gluten, don't eat sugar, whatever. Um, there's actually a really funny story. Um, and I think it's helpful. I wanna tell the story because I think it'll, it'll help potentially if you are dealing with these symptoms. So um, part of my, one of my, IBS symptoms was to hiccup and then to do this little burp, like hiccup burp, very strange. Um, and so I would do that. I was in college and I'd have Spanish right after lunch. And so I had a Spanish minor. So I was taking Spanish class and um, hiccup burping through it. And so my Spanish professor would always call me la borracha, which means the drunk. So he's always like accusing me of being drunk in class, which of course I wasn't. And so I was like, well, I just ate lunch and that's why I hiccup and burp. But I never really questioned why I didn't do that at breakfast. Why didn't I do it after dinner? I only did it at lunch. But when I look back on that situation, I can see now it was an experience of anxiety because I really hated the class oral participation in Spanish because I was feeling like nervous about speaking in Spanish. So that's what we start to do. We start to question our assumptions and conclusions around what's causing the symptoms. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So, um, so I had. Uh, definitely influx of symptoms in college. Um, and that gut distress was really a constant um, issue for me. Um, out of college, I started to see a naturopath. Um, I went to the, like the traditional route. I went to naturopaths. Um, I was diagnosed with all kinds of things like leaky gut, uh, candida overgrowth, a long, long list of food intolerances. I basically had to eat like a really strict, strict paleo diet. If you're familiar with what that avoids, like um, food restrictions around gluten, dairy, um, no sugar, no heavy carbs or any, any like starches, starchy vegetables. I mean, I was like very limited in what I was allowed to eat all to help not only like the gut distress, but the, I was told that those things were linked to my other symptoms, like chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, pain, a lot of other symptoms that um, have been mentioned that I've had. So those, um, that mix of being told that food was causing all this, these problems and these diagnoses, like the actual IBS diagnosis, that, um, that really created a lot of anxiety around me, in me, and especially in re as it relates to certain foods. So that's really kind of a brief overview of my symptoms. Okay. How did you teach yourself? Cause you're talking about how you over time learned that then these foods were essentially bad for you. So how did you learn to be able to eat these foods again? Mm -hmm. And how do you help other people to do this? 
Yeah. So this is, it's kind of a hard question to answer in some ways because it's going to be different for different people. There are different pathways um, into this work is the way that I say it. But I will say for me, um, starting with belief system around what you what you believe is causing what. So for me, recognizing that the root cause was not food, it was anxiety, or the root cause was fear, or the diff- difficult emotions, stressors, trauma that it was holding down in my body. And um, that's what my brain was trying to protect me from. So the brain sends all kinds of mind body sensations, including all the IBS sensations as a way to kind of try to protect us from the experience of anxiety or um, difficult life situations or memories or the like. So I hold anxiety in my gut and I think it's a pretty common human experience to do that. Um, My, when I'm nervous, my gut bloats. So um, that was, I think that was why in some ways it started there. Um, but the key, I think, is to start to see symptoms rightly. So then you can address the experience of anxiety. So when we're blaming food or an IBS diagnosis, we're literally covering over the anxiety or distancing ourselves from it. Um, anxiety or difficult emotions like anger, fear, grief, loss, um, deep rage, which I was also holding. So I also had a harder time recovering the IBS symptoms for me because I had such an intense amount around the actual foods, amount of fear around the foods. So um, I had gone to a naturopath who, um, you know, she worked with me convincing me that the food sensitivities were causing all these problems. And so I, I literally had a very intense fear and anxiety around food. I didn't, I wasn't super aware of it. Um, but I was often like the gluten police in my kitchen. I have a fam- large family, four kids, my husband. And it was only after I was healing, he was like, oh yeah, you're super intense about gluten. And I was like, oh, really? He's like, yeah, you're totally freaking out. Like, don't put your weight in my almond butter or whatever. Like I was so, I was, I was intense about it and very fearful about it. And that fearful pathway, it perpetuated the symptoms. And I really had, I was locked in that fear about it. So for me also, when I learned, I should say, when I learned about mind body recovery, I was very disabled. I was using a cane. I was about to get my own wheelchair. I was, life was very small. And so for me, food um, issues weren't the most important symptom to start with. I wanted to like walk again without a cane and have enter enough energy to cook or take a shower or be out of bed, you know, I'll go to a store. So one of the reasons why I didn't get really around to IBS symptoms at the beginning was I couldn't work with all those symptoms all at once. It's too overwhelming. I mean, I think it's a lot to ask. So I had to take symptoms one thing at a time. So um, anyway, um, there was something else I was going to say about that question in the way that you go about Oh, so the other piece of it too, is that it's sometimes harder to reverse irritable bowel type symptoms because, um, and I'm going to get to this in a minute, but for, for many of us, it's a, it's an experience of a higher level of anxiety than some other kinds of symptoms. And it can be, um, you know, we know that mind body symptoms are coming from this repress when we repress life experiences, repress emotions or suppress them and kind of like skirt them to the side. We're literally holding these life forces of um, what emotions are in our lives are really like the life energy and force of being human. And we're trying to like contain it in this shell that's really not meant to hold and hold all that in. So that creates a lot of inner turmoil, which, um, and that can be related those emotions can be related to trauma, um, either in childhood, early adulthood, they can be related to our current life stress, what's going on in our lives and even how we treat ourselves. And for me, um, as a child, I went through a sexual trauma. And, um, when I look back on why IBS started in college, it was like the first serious romantic relationship that I had. I'm like, no wonder my gut was like freaking out. And I'm still 
married to my husband, the same guy that I had a serious relationship with in college. And so I look at that now and I understand, yeah, it wasn't food. I was freaking out internally about a relationship and it was showing up in my gut and eventually showing up in other symptoms. So um, the other, I, I didn't mention these tools. So this is the last thing I know I've been, this is a long answer. When I work with clients um, for, with a variety of sensations and symptoms, including IBS, what can really help, um, Chaz, you asked me like, how did I start to add food back? Um, is to not try to do it all at once in a really intense way, but to, to really use the tools of graded exposure, somatic tracking, really um, embodied affirmations. And when I say embodied, like you can throw around an affirmation, like I'm safe, I'm healthy. No, go away. You know, IBS symptoms stop. But if, if you say those things and they don't like, and they kind of like ping off of you and you're like, yeah, I don't really believe any of that. It's not really something that you're like believing on a gut level embodied way. And so finding affirmations that are really starting to soothe that anxious part of you and bring a sense of calm, starting to bring a sense of safety. Um, creating safety is pretty much everything in my body recovery. And there's a variety of ways of doing that. But when we create safety and we resist the temptation to like push and, and, um, really kind of stronger ourselves into healing. Um, we, we learn how to like create a lasting um, recovery. And so when we, we have a willingness to stop blaming flu triggers, stop blaming IBS symptoms, even, or a diagnosis, even stop believing old things that practitioners have told us of why these symptoms are here. That's when we start to release those things that are kind of holding those symptoms and we can really start to create safety. Um, there's a lot more I could say. I guess I will say that the other piece of it is that not everyone has to do deep emotional work to heal or to recover. Um, Kent referred to having a book cure. Uh, he read the book and it like made his symptoms go away. Um, but for some of us, and I'm included, one of the reasons IBS symptoms was harder for me to reverse was because it was coming from this um, place where I really need to process difficult life experiences. And I needed to find ways to like name um, the emotions around the trauma and stress that I'd experienced um, in my life. And um, really to name anger, to name rage, fear, loss, and to not just name them, but then to find and explore ways of processing them and releasing them out of my body. That's really where EAT, EAET comes in, which is emotional awareness and expression therapy. Um, which is another arm of this recovery. But anyway, um, that was a really long answer. Hopefully I touched on all the pieces of your question, Chaz. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, a quick follow-up to that is out of curiosity, do you find with cl clients, you, we talk, we're talking about stomach symptoms and IBS um, or other various stomach symptoms. And you mentioned you know, food triggers, which is something we often do learn in this uh, journey like, oh, this food's bad, this food's bad, that food's bad. And we start developing that relationship with these foods. But have you experienced anybody who has the stomach symptoms, but actually has no fear of food and doesn't associate any food as the trigger? Well, that's a good question because I do have, um, I've had some long COVID clients who had some severe um, gut symptoms and I know there are some who haven't like necessarily tied it directly to food, but I think it was the assumption that it was like a long COVID experience. But then I have another uh, long COVID client who recovered and she was limited to literally 30 foods she ate and nothing else. So she, um, but I'm trying to think, yeah, I guess, I think because so often the gastroenterologist approach to dealing with IBS is what are you eating that's upsetting your stomach? And I mean, not to blame them, like they're dealing with a stress induced symptom and they're looking for a, you know, a cause. Um, so yeah, I don't, I'm not sure that I do have a really concrete example of that. Um, is that something you've run across? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I was just curious. Um, but do you find that, okay. So do you find that 
unlearning symptoms like IBS or stomach conditions is different or harder than unlearning something like a muscular pain? Yeah. So that is, that's a good question. There's a, um, when I, so when I was working through, when I was first introduced to this approach, I started with Dr. Schumer's unlearn your pain book. Cause a friend of mine had recovered and I started there and I got through a certain, um, portion of it. And then I was like, oh, I cannot do this work alone. I need to work with someone else. This is way too much for me. And it was. And so, um, I ended up working with an ISTDP therapist and um, she taught me the difference between striated muscles, uh, muscle anxiety, um, smooth muscle anxiety, um, cognitive perceptual disruption. And um, the fourth one is conversion. So motor conversion. So those are different levels. She taught me in the sense that there are different levels of anxiety, um, different intensities, but um, a striated muscle anxiety is really the experience of um, muscle tension in the, the muscles that are in our skeletal system. And they're really under voluntary control. So I can like move my arms and hands. If you think about your limbs and your neck and your head, like, you know, you can, you're under control and you can voluntarily like freeze them or move them. Um, a lot of those types of striated muscle anxiety, the way that shows up in the bottle body is um, through muscle spasms and um, causes symptoms like fibromyalgia pain, headaches, back pain, like neck, shoulder, chest, hand, foot pain. Um, it can also cause panic, like hyperventilation with dizziness, um, tingling in the hands, shortness of breath. I've had a variety of those symptoms. I, um, I re-looked up what these cause um, in Hidden From View. This is a book by Dr. Schubiner and Alan Abbas. And um, it's a phenomenal book for practitioners and well, for anyone, but um, they describe it in depth in that book. And then smooth muscle anxiety, it's really how anxiety shows up in the involuntary muscles that aren't under our control. I think sometimes those can be more difficult to nail down. So I can't like talk to, to like hot symptoms or gut symptoms in, you know, the IBS symptoms and say, Hey, stop like stop loading. But I could, I literally did tell my physical like extremity pain to stop. And it started to work when I was recovering. So in a sense, um, the smooth muscle anxiety affects the, these different parts of our bodies, cardiovascularly, um, our respiratory system or GI system, um, urology, neurology. Um, some examples would definitely be IBS. Like we've been talking about, um, chest tightness, which causes, of course, a lot of fear and anxiety. I have um, a number of clients who've recovered from POTS, and that's a common symptom in POTS um, is chest, you know, issues with your chest. Um, anyway, there's a number of, I can, I can share more. Let's see, reflux, vomiting, um, abdominal pain, interstitial cystitis, which is a real attention in the bladder, um, Raynard's, flushing, um, all those kinds of things. I will say that um, an even deeper level of anxiety that I experienced is something where often your vision is um, impaired, where you can get like blurry vision um, and that unconscious anxiety is really called the cognitive perceptual anxiety. So I never had motor conversion and that's when your, your body, instead of like going super tense everywhere, which is the striated muscles um, re response of anxiety, the motor conversion really, your body just like falls slack. And you can, I don't know if you've experienced this, anyone listening, but where like your legs will give out on you or um, you faint, even having like poor memory, like mental disturbances, as far as like your memory going blank, um, tunnel vision, that kind of thing. So these are different, what's interesting and what I think can help bring a lot of hope, at least I, I hope it does for you, is to recognize that this is how anxiety shows up in our bodies. And for so many of us with mind body symptoms, especially if you're like me, where you've had like years and years of like, now my body's doing this. Now my body's doing that. Why do I have all these different weird symptoms? And, and you're like, sometimes you're like, really can stress really cause all of these symptoms? That's crazy. And it does seem crazy, but when you start to understand how anxiety shows up in these different muscle groups of the body and what's 
really physiologically and medically normal to have stress show up this way, I think it gives us like, it, it opens, it creates an opening for us to believe that this is mind body and, and a way forward for how to treat it. Because then we start treating the experience of anxiety instead of treating all of these symptoms with these like pills and all the things that we do, right? Thank you so much. I really love and appreciate that answer. I, I feel like I, my, I've personally, and also I know so many people who, yeah, the stomach symptoms can sometimes linger or be one of the harder ones to overcome. And it, as I listen to you explain this, it really makes sense. And it, it makes sense why I, when I first found Dr. Sarno's book, I also was able to just eliminate the, the muscular pain almost instantly. Like I had no fear around it instantly and started exercising and resuming activity. But the gut stuff was like, I couldn't wrap my head around that part that took a lot longer and just believing alone wasn't enough. And so as you explain this difference, it makes sense. And I've never heard it explained that way. I love how you broke that down. If you wouldn't mind um, putting the name of the book in the chat for anybody who might be interested in that particular book. Um, and let's see here. And I do just want to say right now that someone says also, uh, thank you for acknowledging that rewiring IBS symptoms and reintroducing foods can take longer than rewiring other symptoms. I've been retraining for three years and I am now focusing on how I can reintroduce foods slowly and with more success. So, yeah, so it definitely, I think is helpful to hear how you explain that for, for people. I'd love to say, thank you. I'd love to say a little more about into reintroducing foods slowly. Thank you um, for this comment. Um, I do think that um, one, we, we have the opportunity to change our assumption and relationship to what's causing what, which I mentioned, but recognizing that there's, there's um, we get to rewire reframe, start to re-understand our relationship to food. And as we do, um, those, we, I was actually just meeting with a client today about this and I was in, inviting her to make a food list of, um, the foods that feel accessible to her to try again. And in fact, what I meant by that was like, basically I was asking her to make a list of the ones that cause the least amount of fear in her. So which ones feel like, oh yeah, they're, they, they usually call symptoms, but, oh, I want to try that. So start with like three on that level. And then recognize, I told her like, if you've got the food that's like, oh no, that one, like, I don't know if I'll ever be able to eat that again. And you have a lot of fear around that. Don't start with the largest, biggest roadblock, so to speak. Don't start with the biggest, most intense experience of fear, the link that you have, but try to in introduce them more slowly. And the graded exposure approach that um, Dr. Schubiner taught me in his practitioner training, Really, it starts with a level of imagination where you imagine yourself eating that food. You imagine yourself, you picture it, you can like look at a picture of it. Or I actually, I've actually had clients bring the food and put it on the desk next to their computer screen. And I'll say, okay, you're near it. How do you feel? Because it's really interesting and curious to, to explore what rises up in you emotionally around fear or anxiety, even being near the food you'd be surprised at what people find. And so then we, we move forward with really um, imagining eating the food, following even like visually, like closing your eyes and like picturing it going down. And what is your food? What is it finding? And I know this sounds maybe a little bit wild, but to be able to use the imagination, because when you're picture doing it, it can trigger a fear response, which teaches you what's actually neurologically what's wired. It's the fear that's keeping that perpetuating the symptoms. So when you can move forward and actually trying that food, not like eating a whole plate of whatever it is, let's just say bread, if you're, if gluten is your thing, not even a whole plate of pasta all at once, but can you try like a little, like single piece of pasta or a small little piece of cracker, that kind of thing. And just with affirmations, with that sense of um, graded exposure, where you you start a little bit of it and you go in and you picture yourself enjoying it with ease, with comfort, assuring yourself with embodied affirmations. There's nothing wrong with me. 
this food actually doesn't pose any danger for me and I can access it and eat it um, without symptoms. And you just do that in a gent gentle titrated way that um, in time you teach your brain this food's safe. I don't have to be afraid of it. Got this. Now I can have pizza or whatever, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. And I love that you brought up the imagination factor because, and not that this will work for or happen for everybody, but sometimes it's such good evidence that we really are onto something and that it's more mind body because, um, some people just imagine eating a food and actually have a reaction. And if you actually just imagine eating it and have a reaction, that is like ding, 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 absolute evidence that it's not the food, <laughs> you know? It's like, if, if you're reacting and you haven't even put it in your system, it's showing that it's actually your brain's perception that it, and, and of the food that is the problem. So I think that's a really helpful tip. Um, somebody is asking, if lactose intolerance can also be mind body syndrome. Mm. Yeah. Kent, do you want to speak to that? I see you made a comment. Just from what I've heard in uh, basically lactose intolerance is similar to celiac disease in which it's not something you can unlearn generally speaking, but you know, in theory, just like with wheat, there's people who who may think they have celiac disease who don't and have a reaction to wheat um, that could be unlearned. In theory, that could be possible of dairy where you think you have uh, lactose intolerance, but it's more of a learned um, a learned reaction to eating dairy. And so I actually would be curious to know, Michelle, have you ever like worked with somebody dealing with lactose intolerance and trying to assess whether it's more of a hardwired intolerance or something that is changeable? Yeah, that's a good question. Not specifically lactose intolerance as a solo food sensitivity. Um, I think everyone that I've worked with has had like a long list of foods that they were sensitive to. And um, there was a lot of, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about different clients. Um, Yeah, I would say I don't have the experience of someone just having lactose intolerance. I do think that um, dairy, I do know that dairy, gluten, sugar, um, uh, legumes, certain, you know, there's certain categories of foods, nightshades, there's certain categories of foods that practitioners, whether they're Western practitioners, the GI docs, or um, naturopathic, chiropractic, that kind of um, approach do tend to say, those are like, you know, if you go on an elimination diet, those are things you're taking out. And um, so could lactose intolerance be mind-body syndrome? Absolutely, I think it could. But like Kent said, if you have an actual sensitivity, I mean, there's whole cultures, there's whole Asian cultures that are sensitive to lactose. Like that's not a mind, you know, so, um, in that right. sense, I think it, it would take some experimentation and I think graded exposure would be a great tool to use. Mm -hmm. And most likely somebody who has a sensitivity to dairy has sensitivity to other food types too. So you could start with those other ones. And if you only have lactose intolerance and no sensitivity to other foods, that would be an indication that your lactose intolerance is more likely to be like a hardwired kind that can't be reversed or unlearned would be my mm -hmm. guess. Not, not example, being expert my... at this at all, but that's generally yeah. how we tend to think about neuroplasticity. My husband yeah. is lactose intolerant and he, he jokes, we're not baby cows. We shouldn't be drinking milk, <laughs> but like, you know, everyone's different in that sense. So, but he doesn't have the mind body symptoms in the gut. So if you are lactose intolerant and you're seeing it as a, as a reason to cause a host of different symptoms, that's where I would start with you as a if you were a client, so it's like, let's look at your symptoms. What symptoms are typical of lactose intolerance? And is your long list of symptoms outside of the window of that, right? How the body, like, does it fit the way the body shows up usually with, with medically speaking with symptoms? So that's something to explore too. Yeah. And I'll add in that my experience, something that I've learned is if it's something that you were born with, they say that it's likely an actual like allergy that 
probably can't be unlearned, but if it's something that you developed at some point in your life, even as a child, then I personally would say experiment with unlearning it because I do believe almost anything is possible. And I've actually like heard stories of people with quote unquote lactose intolerance, uh, rewiring their brain to be able to handle all types of dairy. So yeah, I would say if you, if you developed it, um, as like adult onset or child onset, there's a reason that you developed it and you'd never know if there could be like an emotional component or something happened at the time you ate it and the brain perceived it as a threat, just the way it can perceive anything else in the world as a threat in a moment of stress. So, um, yeah, I guess if somebody wanted to like eat dairy that bad, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a bad thing to experiment with <laughs> unless it was like life-threatening, you know, the symptoms. But I love how you mentioned, Michelle, like to start with what symptoms are actually presenting, right? Because one person can have, like, there's generally like a certain set of symptoms for something that's really specific, like a, an actual allergy. And if you're having completely different symptoms or reactions, that could also be an indicator. Um, okay, I want to get into a couple of the questions that have been submitted so far. So the first one is, uh, what can you do when your nervous system is all messed up, causing excessive malnutrition, difficulty swallowing, no saliva, tears or sweat, and a stomach that isn't seem, uh, working? My body thinks all foods are the enemy and it's messed up. I see it as a vagus nerve issue. How can this be related to MBS? I know it came from severe stress over mold in my house where I was passing out. And now I'm having to rent a room with money I don't have. And it's become a mess. Thank you for that question. Um, I think your question can apply to all of us because to one level or another, when you have mind-body symptoms show up, it's a nervous system dysregulation. So when you... Um, when we deal with difficult life stress um, currently or from past trauma, or even in how we're treating ourselves in um, injuries that we get, and then um, the brain perpetuates the symptoms, all of those things trigger the danger signal in our brains, which kicks in the fight, flight, or freeze response. And when the brain has that danger triggered and that fight, flight, or freeze response is, is kicked in, but the brain goes into protective mode. Um, trying to protect us from difficult emotions. And that's how symptoms get created. And Schubiner talks about um, this in his course, um, his practitioner training that I took. And when those symptoms are created, then we become fearful, worried, and focused about the symptoms we're experience, experiencing. And that, that fear, worry, and focus on the symptoms themselves re-triggers our danger signal. And we get, we get stuck in this fear, symptom, fear loop um, that's hard to break. So I, I hear you and your question about all of these symptoms you're dealing with and um, the, the dysregulation and really the breakdown of relationship with our bodies that can happen with these severe symptoms can be really challenging. Describing you're saying that the, um, your body thinks that all food is the enemy. And that's like a really strong statement that I have been there in that sense where you're like, really struggling with that relationship and wanting to, I would really encourage you to take small steps towards rebuilding a relationship with yourself and with your body. And maybe that seems like a vague response, but even if it is a vagus nerve issue, the vagus nerve can be soothed through a variety of different tools. Um, uh, especially Peter Levine in somatic experiencing uh, has a lot of vagus nerve exercises that can help regulate the system. Um, and that's related to mind-body sy syndrome and TMS because, because it's, it's still related to how we understand, why we understand we're having symptoms that we are. And so we really want to understand, um, the goal becomes to really start to understand what, what stressors are triggering us, what triggers our symptoms and then how we can create safety um, in variety of practices. And when I say variety of practices, I'll give some examples because I didn't before. Breath work is incredible for regulating the nervous system. The regulating breath in particular, when you breathe in for like a certain number of counts, let's say four to five, and you breathe out, exhale for even longer, it activates the parasympathetic nervous system in our brains 
which reduces the experience of anxiety. We want with MBS symptoms um, and, even, and vagus nerve issues, we want to get to this place where we're reducing anxiety. So um, breath work, um, expressive writing is a huge tool for many people in recovering. Um, really breath work involved with movement. So um, combining that, that could be yoga or gentle stretching, um, anything that really brings you a sense of calm. And um, that's where I would start. Um, but when we're in survival mode, I just wanna say, this work is really hard. And when we're in survival mode and we're just trying to put our pieces together, we might not have the capacity yet to do this work, but we can trust that in time we might. And um, you know, when we're really under a lot of money, financial stress or living situation stress, those are times when maybe we don't have as much capacity as we, we might once those situations become more regulated. Um, I don't know if that feels helpful um, or if Chaz or Kent have anything to add, but. I don't, but if whoever asked that question, if you want a, to ask a follow-up question, feel free to put it in the chat. I felt like it was supportive. All right, I'm gonna go on to the next question. If anyone has any follow-ups, remember you guys can ask at any point. Uh, somebody did ask you, Michelle, if your alignment and structural issues related to EDS resolved as well, such as joint subluxations, ribs that go out of place, upper cervical spine that goes out of alignment. She, she or he says, when I get things aligned by a body worker, it helps my symptoms dramatically. And I can feel with my hands when my rib is out of place or in place, for example. So I'm having a hard time fully convincing myself the best I've been able to come up with. And I really do think is, is this plausible is that when my nervous system is out of whack, it manifests as a body that is physically out of alignment. What an incredible insight. I'm just going to go with you there, Karina, and say like, sometimes our bodies present with certain symptoms for a reason. And I want to give you an example from my own story, and then I'm going to answer your question. When I was diagnosed with EDS, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, I was diagnosed by a geneticist in Dartmouth-Hitchcock. I live in New England. And, um, and, you know, I'm hypermobile. My body bends in ways it shouldn't. And of course that was causing my pain. No, it actually wasn't. Now, if you have EDS diagnosis, I might be rubbing you the wrong way right now. I'm not sure, but it wasn't. I'm so glad that I was wrong because the pain that I was, that was perpetuating my body was actually mind body due to stress, difficult emotions, as I've, as I've already mentioned. But what happened to me within a month of my diagnosis, I literally walked into the hospital in August of that year. Within a month, I was using a cane and barely walking. And I tell you that part of my story to say, I look at it now and I was absolutely terrified to walk into my own future because so many people with EDS are wheelchair bound, are, um, aren't able to work. And I was terrified. By the time we returned five months later, six months later, we returned with my kids, my four kids, and we all tested them all for EDS with the same practitioner. I was wheeled into the hospital because I couldn't walk anymore. That's how much fear took over my body. Now, at the time, my interpretation was like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I have this diagnosis. Now I understand why my feet are doing this and why I can't walk, but it wasn't actually what was happening. So it was, it was the diagnosis itself creating such an intense fear in me. And because it's a genetic connective tissue disorder, I have four kids and I'm, and I'm looking at, they look pretty bendy and flexible too. Crap. They're going to be stuck with a life of pain is what I was thinking. Right. Um, they all bend and they all have EDS and none of them have symptoms. So anyway, uh, to speak to your, I'm sorry to go off on that story, but I couldn't not say it in relation to what you're asking here because EDS is a hard thing and it's really more, more commonly diagnosed now than it used to be. Um, I still can do things with my hands, like my thumb touches my arm, like my elbows go backwards and my knees. And, you know, I'm a very awkward, lanky person if you see me in real life because I've got a bendy body. But 
what I recognized is that actually the area, the sublux, the sublux, um, sublocations that I would have would be my mostly my right knee would pop out of joint and I have to slam my slam my leg straight to pop it back in. When when I um, had that diagnosis, I was told I should never do yoga. Yoga has been one of the primary things to help me heal and continue healing in mind body recovery. And um, I had to work with my fear around that joint going out. So again, for me, it was a fear thing. When fear was higher, when I had the expectation it would go out, um, then it would. But what's also true for me is that I'm not exercising, walking regularly, building strength in my legs, then my joints are more wobbly. So there's a structural component where I need stronger muscles to keep me in line. There's also a fear component, which I had to work to undo. So hearing you say you're having a hard time fooling, convincing yourself, but the best, best way you've come up with it is to really think about it, that like your nervous system is out of whack. And so your body is out of alignment. I think there's something there. And I would really explore the, the deeper emotional roots. Hmm. I think that your answer was awesome, Michelle. I feel like your story was so pertinent and I'm glad that you shared it. Isn't it crazy how sometimes the diagnosis can be more um, harmful than the actual initial symptoms, you know, especially when it's one of those diagnoses that feels like a life sentence. So absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. And the next question, it's not so much a question, but I actually really think you might have something you would like to say to this, Michelle. It's, uh, it says I began my TMS journey with hip pain and, and my pain has moved into feeling anxiety in my stomach. Nausea and sinking feelings are now my norm. I get caught up with how to feel my emotions that I know I am repressing. I'm doing ISTDP, but it is hard work. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Um, hip pain has been one of my longest symptoms and um, everything else for me is completely better. But if I press my finger on my hip, I can still have a little bit of pain, but it's not something that, I mean, I'm physically active and I do yoga and I do, um, you know, exercising like normal physical life. I never take naps. Like I'm back to myself, but there is something about for me. And I don't know. Um, I don't know your history or your story, but sometimes when we look at the kinds of trauma that we've been through, um, there's this whole region in our bodies, the pelvic bowl, the pelvic floor, um, hips, buttocks, um, lower gut, where um, sometimes we have that held there because of there's certain, I mentioned sexual trauma, there's certain kinds of trauma that are really held up in the body. If you've ever read The Body Keeps the Score, something that I read when I was recovering by Basil Brandicock, it's an amazing book to talk about how that happens. So um, this work can be intense. And I hear you like getting caught up with how to feel your emotions, um, knowing that there's a lot of repression going on. I think that's where putting all the support structures in place that you can is huge. And for me, I mean, I worked with an ISTDP therapist for um, two years, pretty much almost weekly. I did have like a three month break in there. Um, and um, we went places I didn't know we, I had to go. <laughs> and I, I mean, I laugh about it. It's not funny, but I also think that um, the amount of healing that this work can open up in our lives is definitely about reducing symptoms. And, but it's also so often it invites us into a much deeper emotional healing that leads us to things in our lives we never dreamed of. So I know it's hard work, but I encourage you to keep going and to create as much safety for yourself as possible. Caveat on ISTDP therapy is there some I've had clients who've worked directly with ISTDP therapists, and it's not been a good fit. It is not a cure-all approach. On some practitioners, the way they practice it, it's too forceful, it's too intense, and it ends up being re-traumatizing. So if that's someone's experience, I would just encourage you to find someone who's really going to be aligned with you to help you feel safe as you're recovering. Um, the last thing I'll say about you know um, anxiety 
starting with hip pain and then moving into your stomach and the sinking feelings is I would encourage you to, to develop a somatic tracking practice where you're starting to really listen to the symptoms. Because if you think about it, and I talk about this a lot with clients, um, my experience and the way that I describe it in my course, I have a, by the way, I have a recovery course called how we heal chronic pain and fatigue. And I now I have a self-guided version of it. Um, but, um, the top layer really tends to be our physical symptoms. The symptoms that the brain is creating. And for so many of us, I want to say hundred percent, which maybe seems ridiculous, but I've never met a client or a student who doesn't have anxiety as the next layer. So if, as your symptoms are reducing anxiety increases for you, that's pretty much every, almost everyone's experience, maybe not at a hundred percent, but, um, so the top layer is physical symptoms. The next layer is anxiety. And doesn't that make sense? Because the reason these symptoms are showing up is because the danger signal is being triggered and the fear response is, is kicked in. The fight, flight, or freeze or fawn response, that's an anxiety producing response. So we have anxiety. The, the deeper, the third layer that not everyone has to go into, but some of us do, and I was one of those people, am still, um, as far as being present to our deeper emotions, the deeper repressed emotions. And so getting into that layer, it's a wild journey because it's, it's, we're accessing the subconscious and the subconscious doesn't really appreciate us knocking on the front door and being like, Hey, let me in. Like, there's a lot of different ways to go about that. Um, I, I think creativity actually opens up a lot of possibility for us to access the subconscious in ways that we can't in them. Um, other ways, but I'm getting off into another topic. Um, thank you for sharing. I want to continue to encourage you to keep going with this work and can, can continue to create as much safety as possible for yourself, recognizing that that could include finding a, a better aligned practitioner, or it could include, you know, developing a more support structures in your life. So. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I have another question. Uh, somebody asks, what is the balance of using medications and injections, et cetera, and also doing this work? Could my continuing to go to pain management, chiropractic, and other things be sabotaging my efforts with TMS? I'm so glad you asked this, Maria. Um, so I have a couple of thoughts. Sarno, and Schubiner both encourage you to stop all, well, Sarno especially said, stop all treatments. You don't need them. And they're going to inhibit your, your recovery. Um, and I want to say that because if you're believing that this medication injection, all the different supports that we put in place to get through chronic symptoms, right? If you're believing that you need those, you're solidifying in your brain, the neural pathway belief that this is a physical symptom. But if it's a mind body symptom, it's not a physical symptom. You're physically okay. You're medically okay. And that's why, by the way, I will say the very first approach to this work is to get ruled out, get um, major medical um, diagnoses and causes ruled out by your medical practitioners. Because not only does that, of course, you want to find like a root cause that is medical in case it's there, but those kinds of tests to get all the major things ruled out, it can create safety. It can help us realize, okay. I actually am medically safe. And so if I am, do I need this cortisone injection? What am I covering up? I mean, you can ask yourself, uh, let's just say, you know, injections, a really common one is cortisone for back pain. Um, is this cortisone injection going to cover up the emotion, stress situation, stressful situation happening in my life that I don't have to feel or be present to because it's kind of, it's, it's padding it. Right. But what I also want to say is that I, I encourage, I, I feel like a broken record and you probably think I am in saying that creating safety is utmost importance because when we feel afraid, it increases anxiety and it triggers our danger response. We want to have, move forward in a safe way. So if you have like five or six different practitioners and supports and you're new to this work, ripping all of them out all at once could really trigger you and be really terrifying because they've been supportive people in your life. So um, doing it in a slow, titrated, slowly titrated way could be really helpful. Everyone's going to do that differently though. Some of us are super intense like me and we're just going to like dive in the deep end and deal with the consequences. And other of us, 
we're going to try to do this, you know, cut things back slowly. When I tell clients they've got, I never, by the way, give medical advice. So that was not a medical advice to you. And I would never, I would never encourage any client or student of mine to change their medication or other medical treatments um, without the supervision of their practitioners, their doctors. So that's utmost importance. The other thing that I will say is that you can look, if you're certain that the symptoms are mind body, but you have too much fear around letting go of a chiropractic adjustment, if you can look at it as a bridge to get from where you are now to where you're ready to let go of that, then that's okay. But what if you can look at it as a bridge where you say, okay, I'm not fully ready to not do this, but will I be in two months, one month, two weeks? And so can you start to get yourself ready to say, this is no longer serving me. This is so oftentimes those practitioners are perpetuating our, um, our physiological interpretations of our symptoms. And that's what can be really, that can stand in the way of us really embodying the mind-body approach. And so we wanna be listening to and reading and studying and practicing mind-body science, uh, mind-body tools, um, working, um, you know, listening to podcasts like Chaz's and others, like really like um, saturating ourselves in this approach. That's a long answer. I'm sorry for it's long winded. It was great. Thank you. Okay, you guys, we're gonna do one more question, and then we're actually going to um, have Michelle lead us through a tool called somatic tracking for some of you that might be familiar and for some of you that might be new. So we'll have her answer this last question, and then you guys can stick around, and we'll spend a few minutes doing this somatic tracking tool together. One, I would encourage you, if you don't yet have a therapist walking through this with you, to access that. Because whenever we have anxiety or depression, and it's those are both common mind-body symptoms, they can also be chemically related. Um, and I'm not going to speak to all of that right now, because I'm not a medical practitioner primarily. But whenever we have anxiety or depression flooding us, to where it's affecting our everyday lives in a severe and um, really impairing way, it's a sign for us to get weekly support. And I would encourage you to get weekly support from a trained therapist. Um, that's what I tell every single client I work with in mind-body coaching and my students in my course. Because when we want to work with this mind-body work, we need a certain level of capacity. Like you need to have, to be in a place where you're, um, able to work to, you know, do the practices and, and, and study and learn. And when we're really in a very scary, dark, depressive state, that's often not a place where we have a lot of capacity. So I, that's my first foremost, to keep yourself in a relationship that's going to help you stay safe. And it's going to teach you how to regulate again. Um, I will say um, my therapist talks about depression, uh, and I think this is a really interesting description as anger tur turned inward. Her experience of depression, when it's a emotional based and not a chemical based, is that we have a lot of anger and we can't express and release it, and so we turn it in on of ourselves, and it it really causes a lot of depression. Um, that's a fascinating perspective. Whether or not that's something that you relate to, but if you were working with this with long COVID, tech, using the techniques and the breath work, and your fatigue was improving, and then now you're depressed, I would explore with a therapist, not alone, um, the the role of anger in in the symptoms that you're experiencing. Um, so, yeah, I I think um, I think the way we recover does affect us. And if we're getting too overwhelmed and um, we can really re-trigger ourselves. So providing, you know, accessing all the support that we need in therapy or in um, coaching support, whatever we need. I think that's, it's good to recognize that it's really ours to, to heal in a way that's going to be, that's going to work for us, for our mind-body symptoms. I do want to mention too um, that 
my my how we heal course it's a um course that teaches this whole approach with a lot of teaching and tools and handouts um i wanted to give everyone here if you're interested in in an approach like that and you're really wanting to explore it um a hundred dollars off the course for the next two weeks if it's something that would be helpful and supportive for you um i can put a link in the chat um to there's a special discount page if you're interested in that or if you just need other um, resources or tools. Um, I have a lot of free resources on my website as well. And Kent has a ton of free resources on the This Might Hurt film um, website. So there's a lot out there to explore in what he's really curated on his website too. Thank you, Michelle. All right, so I think we will cut the questions uh, there. And I think, everybody's questions got addressed either via Michelle or in the chat by Kent. Um, you guys, like we've already said, we're all accessible. So uh, you have my email, you have access to me. Uh, Kent put his um, information there for the film. Michelle's got her contact information. So if you have other questions or you want resources, there's lots of options out there. And with that, I think we're gonna turn it over to Michelle to guide us through a somatic tracking experience. Sure. Thank you so much for hosting this, Chaz and Kent, for inviting me tonight. It's been a real privilege, and I really consider it an honor to speak about this work. And if this tonight has created any small little window of hope for you that you can recover, my biggest encouragement is to follow it. That's an opening that's been created for you. And maybe you didn't have that opening before. So I'd encourage you to follow that, explore this approach in an unpressured, safe way. And, um, and I want to encourage you that healing is possible. It absolutely is. Um, so thank you, Lynn, for saying that. Really appreciate you showing up and everyone else too. Um, so we're going to go into a very brief somatic tracking. I'm going to try to keep it brief. Um, this is something that I do with clients a lot. You can access a variety of somatic tracking online as well. Um, I have a somatic tracking in my course too. So not, I just want to mention that not everyone is ready to go direct, directly into the body. Um, I was very, very disassociated from my body. And I'm not sure that somatic tracking would have helped me as much in the very beginning. So if you'd identify with being, feeling like very distant from your body and have a hard time being present with what you feel, this may not be your best practice. So I'm going to just say that as a caveat. So if, but if you'd like to try it, I'd love to have you do it with me. Um, so you can start. And if you feel comfortable um, keeping your video on, you can, but if you want to do it with me and you want to like lay back and like feel comfortable, just like closing your eyes, you can turn your video off if it's more comfortable for you. Um, so I'd like you to start by closing your eyes and just start to notice your breath. You might even slow it a little bit. If you're familiar with a regulating breath or other breath work, you could inhale for four to five to six counts to your comfort level. And once you're at the top, you can pause and then exhale for four to five to six, even up to eight, nine, 10. Follow your own body's rhythm of your breath for a few cycles. And when you breathe out longer, I already mentioned how that can really calm the experience of anxiety. And so, during this short meditation, if you ever feel a spike of anxiety or a desire to like, oh, I can't do this, no way, kind of rising up in you, ignore everything I'm saying and just return to your breath and go back to your breath to bring a sense of calm. So in somatic tracking, what we're doing is we are trying to attune to sensations in the body without fear. Our goal is to change our relationship to the sen sensations. So oftentimes we use this when we're actually experiencing a sensation. So what I'd like you to do is just 
as you're continuing to breathe, you don't have to count. You can, you know, whatever you want to do as far as that. But I want you to kind of just scan through your body. You can start with your head and kind of move down or just kind of be present to whatever is rising up in you and choose a physical sensation you're experiencing now. And that physical sensation could be a dull ache, a sharpness. It could be tingling, numbness. It could be um, any, you know, what we talked about in the gut as far as like nausea or bloating. Um, just choose one sensation and use your breath. And I want you to breathe into that sensation. Like you're giving it air. You're giving it space. And just notice it. So oftentimes when we have unpleasant sensations in the body, we have a tendency to like want to run away from it. Of course, we're like, ah, stop the pain or whatever the sensation's going on, right? We want to distract ourselves from it. But what somatic tracking asks us to do is to be present to it. So simply watch it. You can continue to breathe into it if you want, picturing your breath expanding that sensation on the inhale and then on the exhale. So with this practice, you're not trying to change it. There's really no goal except to attune to it. It might decrease, it might shift, it might stay the same. And any of that's okay. Because all you're doing is being with it. Watching it. Telling yourself, these sensations are safe. Your brains learn they're dangerous. And that's why the brain is creating symptoms in this area for you. So in somatic tracking, you get to teach your brain that this sensation is safe. Just like I referred to the EDS pain in my knee, I had to learn that that area was safe. So breathe into the sensations and as you watch them, let it go of any kind of ulterior action. Like you really are just paying attention out of a sense of curiosity, even watching it with ease. Like, huh, that's interesting. Look what my brain's doing in my body. Wow. Like fascinating. Um, one visual that I learned from, I think it was Alan Gordon, um, said you could watch it like you're lying down in the grass, looking at the sky, watching clouds shift by. And you know, you can watch a cloud shift by and it turns into all of these different shapes. And you're like, whoo, there goes that one. That's the same kind of very light ease that we can observe our bodies in that same way. So picture yourself watching clouds kind of just roll on by. If sensations are increasing, decreasing, staying the same, any of that's okay. It's really just like shifting clouds because medically speaking, when you have mind-body symptoms moving through your body, you are physically safe. You are no longer in danger. And so you can develop this space using in somatic tracking, you can use an affirmations, visualizations, the breath itself, just reduce fear and attend and attune to it. So I'm going to briefly, this is like the fastest somatic tracking ever. Usually when I do it with clients, it's like a 15 or 20 minute experience. I want you to just notice now the sensation. Maybe you noticed when it started, it was super sharp or dull or whatever you noticed in the beginning. What is it like now? Has it shifted? Stayed the same? Just get curious. If it shifted, how fascinating is it that we can use a short seven minute time to just attune to ourselves and in that tiny little window, our sensations can shift. That is the power of attention without fear.
So I've sort of mixed teaching and a mind body meditation. This has been very untraditional, but what I want you to do is just return to your breath. You can breathe into the area that you were picturing for a couple more cycles. And as you do, reassure yourself this practice of just paying attention to the sensation in your body is actually starting to create new neural pathways, links of safety instead of links of fear. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes, return to the room. If you want to put your camera on, you don't have to. Um, that was literally the fastest amount of tracking I've ever led. And I want to say that um, if I was leading you all with, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, I would pause and have you state, like, what was the sensation like and describe it in detail. And then we continue to attune to it. And then we see how it shifts. The other piece that, that can happen for this is that sometimes you can attune to a sensation and you can get an emotion rise up, or you can have an image come to mind, a color. And so it can be a really, um, intuitive and creative tool as well to help teach you what's inside the sensation. But I'll stop there because I know we're a little over in time. Um, I do want to say like my course, if this approach is new to you and you're like a little overwhelmed on where to start, it can be really helpful. And I really am excited to offer this $100 off to anyone here um, for the next two weeks. And if you just have a question, reach out to me. Um, I do work, someone asked me directly if I work with clients one-on-one. -on -one. I do as my schedule permits. Um, and that's something that we can explore. So you can find my website and, and reach out. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thanks so much, everyone. Have Thank a good night. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Michelle. Take care.